Hello and welcome to the Psychosis Lecture Series. This is Dr. Nicholas Hatcher and in this presentation we will continue our discussion on factors that predispose an individual to psychosis. This is just a reminder as to where we are in the lecture series. In this lecture, we will examine the predisposition and some precipitation and presentation features of psychosis through the lens of psychoanalysis and philosophy. Let's begin by exploring some concepts related to the development of self that informs aspects of psychosis. Ipseity is the experiential sense of being a vital, moment-to-moment, -moment, self coinciding subject of experience. The awareness of subject or self and object or other arises from distinguishing a body schema, which in the context of ego psychology and object relations theory is the ego and consequent establishment of ego boundaries. These are two abstract moments of the unique structure of presence. This presence refers to consciousness. From this perspective, consciousness is the enabling dimension, the place in which the world is allowed to reveal and articulate itself. A fundamental feature of consciousness is its object directedness or intentionality, the fact that consciousness is always conscious of something. This philosophical perspective is also in line with a central tenet of object relations theory. The observation that instead of an individual being driven based on a tension reduction model, as classic psychoanalysts would suggest, we are driven instead toward relation with objects. Two components of self-awareness make up ipseity, pre-reflexive self-affection and reflexive self-awareness. We will explore these two components of self-awareness after exploring a little more detail on the ego and ego boundary development. As the ego, popularly described as the integrating aspect of mind, interacts with subject and object, a boundary between self and not self, internal and external, reality and unreality is formed. The formation of this boundary is necessary in order to adequately integrate the pieces of self, others, and the world. This interaction between subject and object initially and primarily occurs through the mechanisms of projection, interjection, and splitting. These mechanisms form the basis of ego growth as well as defense against anxiety. The process of ego boundary development nears completion around age six. Freud understood psychosis through the lens of what is referred to as decathexis theory. Cathexis refers to the quantity of energy attached to any intrapsychic structure or object representation. In decathexis theory, Psychosis is seen as a regression in response to intense frustration and conflict with others accompanied by withdrawal of emotional investments or decathexis from object representations and from external figures. Freud later revised his view on psychosis, emphasizing that psychosis involves a disavowal and subsequent remodeling of reality. He explained that neurosis is a conflict between the id and ego, and psychosis is a conflict between the ego and the external world. Freud did not work very directly with psychotic patients because he viewed them as incapable of generating a transference, which is an essential component of psychoanalytic psychotherapy. We will now turn our attention to analysts who built upon a conceptualization of psychosis based on their direct work with psychotic patients. Paul Federn, a member of Freud's inner circle, was one of the first psychoanalysts to treat psychotics. His psychoanalytic understanding was influenced by a phenomenological focus. His definition of the ego was experiential and his major concepts were ego feelings, ego boundaries, and ego states. As he understood it, in schizophrenia, the ego is too weak to sustain the dominance of advanced ego states, essential for mature functioning. 
due to overly strong fixations on primitive ego states. Federn saw the prodromal phase of psychosis as beginning with a loss of ego cathexis, while Freud emphasized the withdrawal of object cathexis. Federn supported his position by the observation that psychotics may maintain object interest in the presence of feelings of estrangement. Federn recognized that psychotics were capable of strong transferences, which rendered them analyzable, but he also emphasized the challenge presented by the psychotic's maldeveloped ego, idiosyncratic understanding of reality, and excessive pathological narcissism. Federn's view of withdrawal of ego boundary cathexis and ultimate dissolution of ego boundaries became the predominant view in ego psychology. Consequent to the dissolution of ego boundaries, there is a lack of internal differentiation between the id, ego, and superego, and between the observing and experiencing aspects of the ego. If we consider the developmental trajectory, the ego is born from id, and the superego is born from ego. Failure to generate adequate boundaries, then, explains the level of internal disorganization seen in the psychotic patient. There is consequent difficulty controlling what comes in and what goes out, what is external and what is internal, among other things. The ego system is highly reflective of neurobiological executive networks, including the salience network, default mode network, and central executive network, among other systems. Likewise, in the setting of failure to establish ego boundaries, there is impaired capacity to integrate experience. If one cannot differentiate internal from external, as well as among internal experiences, then it stands to reason that the individual will have an impaired capacity to integrate experiences. Another consequence to this is impairment in ipseity. Now that we have fully addressed the dissolution of ego boundaries, let's return to the two components of self-awareness. It makes sense that these processes stem from the integrity of ego boundaries. Pre-reflexive self-affection is the sense of basic self-presence, the implicit sense of existing as a vital and self-possessed subject of awareness. Affection does not refer to a liking or fondness, but rather subjectivity affecting itself. This is diminished in psychosis, manifesting itself to itself in a way that involves no distinction between subject and object. In a way, there is a question of who is the I at the center of experience. The result is a state of passive receptivity. The individual thus becomes a passive receiver of stimuli, as well as a passive player in the world of self and object representations, influencing the narrative of his or her own life play. Self-awareness refers to a focused attention to mental events. It is an exaggerated self-consciousness in which a subject or agent experiences itself or what would normally be inhabited as an aspect or feature of itself, as a kind of external object. In psychosis, there is hyperreflexive self-awareness that contributes to a degree of hypertrophied or exaggerated introspective self-awareness. This increases the acoustic quality of thoughts, contributing to auditory hallucinations, as well as a shift from being the thinker of thoughts to a perceiver of thoughts. Distortions of obsaity are accompanied by certain alterations or disturbances of the subject's grip or hold on the conceptual or perceptual field. That is, of the sharpness or stability with which figures or meanings emerge from and against some kind of background context. The dissolution of ego boundaries is accompanied by a loss of the stimulus barrier, or what is sometimes referred to in literature as the sensory gate, which normally suppresses the entry of information. This leads to an impaired control 
of what perceptual or sensory data is allowed in. Throughout our day-to-day -day lives, several stimuli are simply blocked from awareness. It is the stimuli that slip past this barrier that get our attention. Therefore, in the context of a loss of stimulus barrier, there is a change in the interestingness or salience of these data. An increase in the interestingness of these data contributes to ideas of reference, where seemingly unrelated phenomena are now in reference to the individual. This contributes to the formation of delusions, as well as a state of chronic sensory overload. Abnormalities in the previously discussed areas, paired with abnormalities in the hippocampus, leads to the generation of false memories. This ultimately builds the basis of logical inference, and when incorporated into delusional explanations, becomes the basis of a delusional life narrative. Argurus and colleagues constructed a model referred to as the ladder of inference in 1985. This model shows how inferences are generated in a stepwise approach. Note that at the base of the ladder, the selection of data based on observation is the first step. The stepwise approach then continues with the addition of meaning to selected observations. Assumptions being made based on meanings. Conclusions being drawn from assumptions. The adoption of beliefs based on conclusions. And finally, actions based on our beliefs. In this model, beliefs are thought to enter what is referred to as a reflexive loop where beliefs tend to affect what data we select next time. The problem isn't that the patient with psychosis loses the capacity to think logically. Rather, they reason logically from an anomalous premise, and so it is that they reach a delusional conclusion. If there is altered perception of data, then it would make sense that the meanings, assumptions, conclusions, beliefs, and actions that follow would be considered abnormal. From a psychoanalytic perspective, we believe that there is inherent meaning in the content of thought in the patient with psychosis. These changes are overwhelming and feeds the primary anxiety experienced in psychosis, annihilation anxiety. The anxiety experienced in psychosis is primarily existential in nature, life versus death, existence versus obliteration, safety versus terror. It can be said that those with psychosis suffer ontological insecurity, where the individual is fundamentally unconvinced of his or her right to a separate existence or unfamiliar with the sense of existing at all. Hallucinations, delusions, and social withdrawal may function as a defense against the resurgence of early anxieties or trauma, which cannot be integrated and subsequently fracture and divide the psyche. This provides a view that the world created by the psychotic is the only one tolerable, the one filled with hallucinatory and delusional content. This generates the question, to what degree are the anxieties and traumas experienced by the psychotic individual from actual events or consequent to the defense itself? This question is persistently debated, and the answer may be different depending on the individual and other surrounding circumstances. Regardless, the meaning given to childhood anxieties by the surrounding environment largely conditions and supports primary identification. This places meaning in a significant light, especially considering the contribution of stress and the fundamental unit of what makes a stressor a stressor, meaning. This concept of meaning and its relationship to primary identification can be conceptualized as well through a Lacanian approach, where Jacques Lacan conceptualized that the combination of linguistic elements ultimately generates subjectivity and meaning. In other words, we are what we speak. Elaboration on this concept is a topic for another time. Now let's branch out beyond the self and incorporate the interaction between self and other, 
through the lens of psychotic disturbance. Harry Sullivan devoted much of his clinical interest in those suffering from psychosis. His conceptualizations are different than those of ego psychology and took more of a relational psychoanalytic perspective. He explains that early interpersonal difficulties, particularly child-parent relationship, produce an anxiety-laden self in the infant and prevents the child from having needs satisfied. This aspect of self-experience is then dissociated, but the damage to self-esteem is profound. The onset of psychosis is a resurgence of the dissociated aspects of self that leads to a panic state and then psychotic disorganization. As a side note, a fascinating concept Sullivan discovered is parataxic distortion. This is where early interactions color the interactions with others in the future. For example, the interactions between child and mother may be reflected in the interactions between husband and wife later. From a relational or interpersonal perspective, working through these early interactions is paramount. This concept is in some ways reflected here in this pattern of dissociated aspects resurging later contributing to a state of disorganization. Donald Winnicott was a psychoanalyst in the object relations tradition who explained that holding deficiencies in early childhood affect the cohesion and unity of the self and the future psychotic patient, creating a future vulnerability in the face of later stresses. Holding is a concept of containing an infant or child acting almost as an extension of ego processes. This goes beyond physical holding of an infant, expanding into the holding capacities of the environment. The absence of such extension or support contributes to a later unclear approach and response to stressors. From an attachment perspective, those with psychosis can be said to have a disorganized or anxious avoidant attachment. Here, the child or adult does not know what to do to meet emotional needs. Some characteristics of this include the following. Feeling scared and sad, approaching strangers trying to find safety, having low self-esteem, and feeling angry and passive. Melanie Klein, the founder of the object relations perspective of psychoanalysis, said the following. The analysis of very young children has taught me that there is no instinctual urge, no anxiety situation, no mental process which does not involve objects, external or internal. In other words, object relations are at the center of emotional life. Furthermore, love and hatred, fantasies, anxieties, and defense. This perspective differs from Freud's conceptualization of instinctual drives. While this is not necessarily the place for a comprehensive exploration into the nuances of object relations theory, the following concepts are foundational to this perspective and our ongoing discussion. An object is a mental representation of interest invested with characteristics or properties. The self refers to the psychic self as it is mentally represented in relation to an entity outside the self. This always occurs as a dyadic structure united by affect. A good way to exemplify this is if the self is a parent, then there is a child as an object. Self-representation and object representation refers to a matrix of emotional experiences of oneself and others. It becomes a culmination of thoughts, feelings, fantasy, memory, and emotional valence. The processes of projection and interjection form the basic methods for ego growth and defensive operations. Together with splitting, these processes act as the basic defenses against anxiety. They serve to foster the integration of the ego 
by aiding in the management of tolerable levels of anxiety and by neutralizing the death instinct. Splitting serves to keep the all good projections, the ideal objects, separate from the all bad projections or the persecutory objects. Object relations is an ego function dedicated to the management of external stimuli that are invested with either libidinal or aggressive energy. The ego function of integration and synthesis that we briefly touched on earlier represents ego functions dedicated to the neutralization of aggression so that libido can predominate. Consider the impact of ego boundary dissolution on the relationship between self and other or self and object. The primary object related disturbance in psychosis is the merging or fusion of a mental representation of a real person or entity with an object representation that has been contaminated with projected elements of self that are experienced in reality. The relationship between subject and object were further elaborated by Melanie Klein and Margaret Mahler. According to Melanie Klein, individuals oscillate between two positions. Here I provided a brief summary of these positions. In the paranoid schizoid position, there is the goal of preservation of the ego in the face of aggressive drives that threaten the ego's limited integrity. Anxiety is experienced as coming from without. Object relations are primarily part objects. This goal is achieved especially through the mechanisms of splitting and projective identification. The psychotic individual is understood to be fixated in this paranoid schizoid position. Normally, however, individuals move into the depressive position, where the preservation of good objects becomes more important than the preservation of the self. There is consolidation of objects into holes. The hallmark of this position is the tolerance and experience of ambivalence and appreciation of objects as a whole without the need for dichotomizing. Anxiety is experienced as coming from within. In this position, the superego is said to develop by way of the Oedipus complex. Splitting refers to a basic ego process of bifurcating impulses and objects, that is perceptions, into all good or all bad qualities. Splitting succeeds in establishing a grossly simplified experience at the expense of objective accuracy and complexity. Like any black or white dichotomy, reality is forced into one or the other categories of being. Kleinian theory goes on to suggest that good objects and impulses are retained while bad objects and impulses are projected. As a consequence of this psychological purification, Objects are reduced to parts, good or bad, and the internal and external environments become antithetical to one another. Hence, a persecutory external world gives rise to a necessary paranoia. Excessive aggression leads to excessive splitting. In order to protect good internal and external objects from contamination with badness, in the event that too many bad objects predominate, further splitting is used, which can result in fragmentation. In other words, a greater and greater dissection of experience. The result of this fragmentation leads to bizarre objects, forming a sense of chaotic and confusing relationships with these minute part objects. As you might imagine, this excessive splitting would also lead to a fragmentation of the ego. The process of projective identification operates together with splitting to foster further management of objects and impulses, while also maintaining a powerful relationship to the part objects. Projective identification serves to create an identification with the internal object by putting a part of oneself into that object and then attempting to control the originally undesirable part of self. 
in the form of an external part object. This functions to achieve control by escaping, through externalization, by schizoid withdrawal, and the expression of oral sadism. Thus, the unacceptable part of self, frustration, and helplessness formed from excessive aggressive impulses is projected outward, where the aggression is experienced as coming from the object of the projective identification. Seagal explained that there is difficulty forming and using symbols in psychosis. Thus, the symbolic link between two objects is abnormal. Two objects coincide and become the one object. There may be no link, no interest, or an excessive link. In the place of the symbol is a form of symbolic equivalence, where this symbol is similar to that symbol. Bion explained that aggression is expressed on links, contributing to disorganization and the world of symbols and language seen in psychosis. Margaret Mahler, who primarily worked with children, described sequential stages of development with the ultimate goal of moving from an internally oriented or fused subject to a separate individual. Here I provided her stages. In the middle of the 1980s, Stern elaborated a revolutionary model of child development according to which many states of the self contemporaneously evolve without losing any of their actual and potential autonomy, even in adult life. According to his observations, the child has, from the first days of life, the ability to differentiate himself or herself from the environment. At the same time, the infant is able to establish close symbiotic ties with other people and external objects, for instance, neonatal imitation. While Mahler's model of child development is linear, Stern's model is circular because it assumes that the self of the child circularly and repeatedly oscillates between states of contact fusion and states of separation differentiation. Today it is widely accepted that in emotionally healthy human beings, different states can coexist in a sufficiently balanced way meaning that they push the person, at the same time, both toward union with others and toward separation from others. In this theoretical context, psychosis has been linked to a too intense conflict that divides and shatters the self, resulting in a crack between the drives toward union with and separation from the other. The severity of this conflict may lead to the person experiencing a dissolution of the self and a sense of psychic death. It has been proposed that the conflict of the psychotic patient between identification, closeness, and even union on the one hand and differentiation processes on the other might have its psychological origins to an antecedent poor integration of opposite states of self called symbiotic and separated self. Here I provided some comments on the countertransference experienced when engaging with an individual with psychosis. Of note, I found the description provided by Nancy McWilliams to be clinically apparent and congruent with what I've heard from colleagues. That is, the countertransference experienced when working with psychosis is akin to normal maternal feelings where the interaction is wonderful in terms of attachment and at the same time terrifying in their needs. It can be deeply consuming in the setting of access to deeply upsetting realities. For downloadable content such as written notes, PowerPoint slides, and more related to this lecture series, please visit my website using the link below. You can also support my goal of continuing to provide new content through Patreon, where becoming a patron will provide you with access to downloadable content as I create new content. Thank you for your support. Here are my references for this presentation. Thank you for listening.